Well, we have a satellite in outer space, a WMAP, that has forced us to rewrite all the textbooks on cosmology. We physicists thought we knew it all, that the universe is made out of atoms. The old picture was that the universe is some kind of soap bubble. This is a picture given to us by Albert Einstein. And the soap bubble, well, it's expanding slowly, but it's slowing down. And we're like flies trapped on flypaper. We can't leave our soap bubble. That's the old picture. The WMAP satellite has forced us to throw out all this and introduce a whole new set of facts. First of all, the soap bubble is not slowing down. It is speeding up. It is out of control. It's expanding so rapidly that it could force a premature death of the universe. But this is the real killer now. This is what's causing so much excitement in the world of physics. We now believe there could be other soap bubbles out there in other universes. other universes that the old concept of a universe, a one universe, is being replaced by a multiverse and satellite data is leading the way. Now we could be on the cusp of a new Copernican revolution. Copernicus introduced the idea that the Earth is not the center of all there is, that the Sun was the center of the solar system. In this new Copernican revolution, our universe is not necessarily the only game in town. That there could be other soap bubbles. That soap bubbles can fission in half, like bud, sprout baby soap bubbles. Baby universes. Baby new, universes. New That's right. And Stephen Hawking has even written about these baby universes. What would they be like if we met one of these baby universes? And speculation has now turned into hard fact, because in six years' time now, a new satellite is going up into orbit called LISA, Laser Interferometry Space Antenna, which could nail it to the wall. Lisa could give us, now get this, Lisa could give us baby pictures, baby pictures of the instant of creation itself. Now think about it, the baby universe emerging from the womb, that's what we hope to get out of Lisa. And some of us are betting, some of us physicists are putting money on the table, believing that when we get these baby pictures of the instant of creation, that maybe there'll be an umbilical cord, an umbilical cord connecting our universe to a parent universe. Because we were a bubble off a previous universe. That's right. right. And maybe our universe has given birth to other baby universes. So another umbilical cord going another way. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, now, people already will be saying, thinking of this and thinking, well, this is, this is physics? This is surely not physics. A, you're first of all rewriting the English language, no longer universe doesn't mean everything, it just means part of everything. And then secondly, you're re rewriting how we think about God, theology, the relig religion, what, what the whole purpose of life is. That's right. If you really think about the multiverse idea, it's staggering in its philosophical and theological scope. For example, when I was a child, uh, I used to go to Sunday school and learn in the Presbyterian Church all about the moment of Genesis, and it was such a thrilling story, this man saying, let there be light. But you know, my parents are Buddhists, and in Buddhism, there is no Genesis, there's Nirvana. Nirvana is timeless, there's no beginning, and there's no end. So for all these years, I had these two mutually exclusive ideas in my head, and how can I reconcile these? Well, now I'm a physicist at the cutting edge of something called string theory, which we can talk about later. But now I realize that the multiverse idea gives this wonderful blend, this melding of these two religious thinking, that Genesis, Genesis takes place continually, continually in an ocean of nirvana. That these bubbles are sprouting out of nirvana, and this nirvana is something we call 11-dimensional hyperspace. It is a much larger space that our soap bubble is expanding into. And so we have a, a beautiful melding of a timeless nirvana giving birth to multiple genesis. Well, I, we'll come on to some of the details in a moment. I just wondered, though, whether you, when you talked about it's like Copernicus saying that the Earth isn't the way we thought of, thought of it before and that, uh, that uh, the sun doesn't go around us, it's the other way around. And these religious examples, you sound like a heretic. And heretics get burned at the stake. We, we don't believe you. you can't, you're upsetting the natural order. Well, in 1600, Giordano Bruno, uh, former, a former Catholic priest, was burned alive by the Catholic Church for saying precisely these things. He talked about parallel worlds in outer space, other suns, and what could be more innocent than the idea of alien civilizations out there in the heavens? But think about it. If you do believe in these parallel worlds in space, the Church would say to itself, is there a Pope? 
Is there a, a trinity? Pope. Is there a parallel Christ? Is there a parallel saints? How many saints are there in outer space? How many popes? Which pope has religious uh, jurisdiction over any other pope? The mind goes crazy thinking about the religious implications of parallel worlds, so the church simply burned him alive. Explain, because one of the most difficult concepts to grasp in, in your book is this question of parallel worlds, worlds and where they are and where these other dimensions are. Everybody knows something is wide and tall and, and understands the concept of time. But where, where is this parallel universe? They're actually in our living room. When I was a child growing up outside San Francisco, I used to look at the carp in the Japanese tea garden. I used to spend hours imagining what would it be like to live in two dimensions, a very shallow pond, fish could swim forward, backward, left, right, their eyes were to the side, but the concept of up, up, up into the third dimension, up into hyperspace made no sense to any fish. And I imagine the scientist there saying, bah, humbug. Anyone who talks about the world of up is talking science fiction. And then I imagine as a child grabbing this fish scientist, lifting the fish scientist into hyperspace where the fish scientist would see other ponds, other ponds, parallel ponds, beings moving without fins, beings breathing without water, that is us, a new law of physics. Now, H.G. Wells, in his novel, The Invisible Man, no one ever reads it carefully to find out how H.G. Wells envisioned invisibility. He envisioned it through the fourth dimension. If I have two parallel sheets of paper, like two ponds, I have us in one universe, but I have another one hovering, just hovering inches above our universe. Light goes underneath the invisible man, so he is invisible, but he could look down on us. So we think that anyone in a higher dimension could be visible to us via its gravity. Gravity does seep across universes. Ah, so by being visible according because of its gravity, there may be a way of proving that this theory is more than just a theory. That's right, and believe it or not, the Hubble Space Telescope over the last several years has been giving us maps of something called dark matter. Dark matter makes up most of the universe. It's not made out of atoms. Your chemistry teacher was wrong in saying that the universe is mainly made out you of are atoms. You get burned at the stake, I can <laughs> see. All the chemistry, anyway, go on. These are the whole generations of textbooks have now had to be thrown out. The universe is not mainly made out of atoms. We are talking about dark matter. It's invisible. You cannot photograph dark matter. We know it's there because of its gravitational presence. The Hubble Space Telescope has indirectly given us maps, gorgeous maps of dark matter pervading the galaxy. Well, some of us believe that we are actually tracing out the outlines of the invisible man, invisible galaxies, invisible worlds hovering just above our universe. Invisible because light goes beneath it, but we feel the effects of its gravity which hops across universes. Which can be, can be measured. But then, can be but, measured. But then, if that is true, at some point, some scientists somewhere will find a parallel universe, will they not? Uh, and, and they are searching for it. We, we think that, uh, first of all, you can detect a parallel universe in several ways. First of all, how does a parallel universe form? Everybody knows that when matter falls into a black hole, it disappears. But, you know, even children ask the question of their parents, gee, daddy, if all that matter falls into a black hole, where does it go? Which is a good question. <laughs> Some of us believe that it's blown out the other end, that it goes through the kitchen sink, but then it's blown out into a white hole. Now, a white hole emits matter rather than swallowing it up. A white hole expands very rapidly to accommodate all this new matter flowing into it. And hey, doesn't that sound like the Big Bang? Doesn't that sound <laughs> like Genesis itself? Our universe could be a white hole. A white hole expanding rapidly with matter flowing into it, connected by an umbilical cord to perhaps a parent universe. I want to talk a bit about the impact on, on humanity and ordinary people, but can you see why, to many people listening to this, it is almost as if theoretical physics has become a new priesthood? Because you can make the calculations, you speak this, uh, you, you're translating your technical language for the benefit of all of us, and we have to take it on trust that you've got it right, and this theory, perhaps, may be the right one. Well, a priesthood is not accountable to anything but its own inner logic. We are accountable to the laws of nature. We have the WMAP satellite up in orbit right now, 
forcing us to rewrite a whole generation of textbooks that said that there's only one universe, that there's only atoms that make up the visible universe. That's the old thing that's been replaced by the WMAP satellite. And in six years, as I mentioned, LISA goes up in orbit. And again, LISA could disprove this, the laser interferometry satellite. Three satellites connected by laser beams making a triangle. The triangle is three million miles across, making it the largest satellite system ever conceived of by the human mind to be launched in 2011. And it'll detect shock waves, shock waves from the instant of the Big Bang. And if the shock waves don't come out right, if the frequency of vibrations that Lisa picks up does not correspond to our theories, our theories go out the window. And however, you have to start again. <laughs> however, if they confirm it, this could be the greatest revolution in philosophy since the Copernican Revolution.